From the moment European fishermen first arrived off the banks of Newfoundland, rogues like Peter Easton, the pirate admiral, had been terrorizing the East Coast. And they were followed by infamous figures like Black Bart Roberts, who prowled the North Atlantic, stealing treasure, ships, and men. But after more than a century of these brigands, change was on the way. Black Bart's death at the hands of the British Royal Navy was a signal the golden age of piracy was coming to an end. Things were about to turn bloody. This is Louisbourg, an old French fortress in Nova Scotia, famous for the pivotal role it played as the French and British empires battled for control of the continent. But 300 years ago, this impressive bastion was just a small port, not much of a fortress at all. That was about to change. In the early 1700s, the east coast of Canada was a frightening place. There were skirmishes with pirates, battles between the British and French, attacks by Mi'kmaq raiders who resisted the European invasion of their lands by commandeering ships, capturing and ransoming colonists. But for the governor of Louisbourg, the most pressing threat of all was loathsome Ned Lowe. Lowe was a new breed of pirate, one much more vicious with a code far less civil. You don't get a nickname like Loathsome for no reason. With authorities clamping down, pirates were fighting back, growing ever more violent. But Ned took it to a whole other level. To avoid capture, he took no prisoners. For his own pleasure, he tortured those he killed. They were often disemboweled or beheaded, or stripped naked, whipped and shot. He made some hold lit cannon fuses until they burned their hands to the bone. Others he burned alive. He cut off lips and noses and once sliced off a captain's ears and seasoned them with salt and pepper before frying them and forcing the man to eat them. When reports of the merciless pirate terrorizing the Grand Banks filtered into Louisbourg, the governor ramped up construction on the fort, erected new defenses armed with dozens of cannons, and built the pivotal island battery too. So this impenetrable fortress wasn't originally armed to defend against the British. It was fortified to defend against pirates like Ned Lowe. And it wasn't just Louisbourg. Britain and France were fed up with piracy and they were cracking down hard. Just a few months after Black Bart was killed, one misty morning, Loesome Ned sailed into this well-protected harbor, St. John's, Newfoundland. He thought he'd spotted the perfect target, a massive merchant ship just waiting to be captured. But he was in for a very big surprise. As Ned grew closer, just before he was about to raise his black flag, he realized his mistake. The merchant ship wasn't a merchant ship at all. It was the HMS Solovey, a British warship sent to protect against pirates. Loathsome Ned made a quick escape, but the Solovey wasn't about to give up its prey. Lowe was chased out of Newfoundland and eventually the Maritimes. When he tried to return, he was driven out again. No one really knows how his story ended, but there are rumors that his crew, disgusted by his deeds, finally mutinied and set him adrift, leaving him to be captured and hanged. The colonists were fighting back. By the beginning of the 1800s, the fun was over. Draconian anti-piracy laws, criminal courts, and many, many more warships were sent to Newfoundland and the Maritimes. Pirates were being rounded up and hanged by the hundreds, punished even more harshly than murderers. And nowhere was that more visible than here in Halifax. As you sailed into the harbor, you were forced to pass through the dangling corpses of pirates left on public display on either side of the channel. 
a gruesome warning to anyone who might dare follow in the footsteps of Peter Easton, Black Bart, or Loathsome Ned. And one of those bodies, hanging on Black Rock Beach, was a lonely figure in an iron gibbet. His name was Edward Jordan. He wasn't much of a pirate. He had none of the bravado, flair, or menace. He only ever stole one ship, but he was treated like the worst of the worst. He was a former Irish rebel who settled in Gaspé Bay as a fisherman to raise a family with his wife Margaret. His livelihood was based on his schooner, which he named for his daughters, the Three Sisters. Jordan had taken a loan from some Halifax merchants to get started, but when he wasn't able to pay them back, they seized his ship. Now unemployed, Jordan and his family were forced to head to Halifax, hoping he could find work, and they were offered a lift on the Three Sisters. It was all too much. Each day that he spent as a passenger on board his own schooner ate away at him. Jordan finally broke. He and his wife shot and killed two crew members, wounding the captain who jumped overboard to escape. He survived to tell the tale, and the story caused a sensation. The notorious Edward Jordan was public enemy number one. He and Margaret were quickly hunted down and arrested. She was soon released. Everyone assumed she'd been forced to do it by her villainous husband. The public even took up a collection for her and the kids. But Jordan would face the full might of a new court system specifically set up to prosecute pirates. He was hanged on the spot where Pier 21 now stands, and then given the Buccaneer Special, his corpse tarred and placed in a gibbet. You can still see the marks, the cage left on his skull, which is kept at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, though no longer on public display. Edward Jordan was left hanging on Black Rock Beach for more than 30 years. And while he wouldn't be the last pirate hanged in Halifax, it was clear piracy was no longer the threat it once was. But the age of sail was far from over. There were still ships to capture and fortunes to be made. It's just that now things would have to be done a little more legitimately. By the 1800s, privateering had exploded in popularity once again. Governments were handing out licenses to plunder and steal letters of mark, happy to have anyone attack their enemies on their behalf. And the biggest prizes came when the War of 1812 broke out, American ones. That's when vessels like this ruled the seas of the East Coast. Originally an American slaving ship called the Black Joke, it was seized by the British Navy, brought to Halifax for auction, and bought by a man named Enos Collins. A Nova Scotian born and bred, Collins started out as a privateer by stealing French and Spanish riches in the Caribbean, and he quickly realized just how lucrative it could be. Colonial governments didn't mind if he kept the ships cargoes and profits for himself, just as long as their enemies suffered. So, when this quick and nimble ship was auctioned off, Collins and his partners snapped it up. He renamed it after his Nova Scotian hometown. The Liverpool Packet was a name that would soon strike fear in American hearts. When the U.S. declared war on Britain and the Canadian colonies in 1812, Collins seized his opportunity, captaining the ship with another Nova Scotian, Joseph Bars Jr., the greatest privateer of his time. They turned their wretched schooner into one of the most profitable privateering vessels ever, and New England's worst nightmare. For two years, they attacked American ships, capturing them and auctioning them off, one after another after another, lining Collins' pockets with American gold. All told, at least 60 American ships were captured by the Liverpool packet, and it was probably more like a hundred. Collins and Bars Jr. weren't alone. Privateers from Nova Scotia brought American trade and military operations in the Atlantic to an absolute standstill. They helped win the war, and they made themselves very, very rich in the process. The merchants of Halifax seized so much loot they had to build these warehouses to store it all. Collins and his partners became so rich, they took their earnings and started one of Canada's first banks. 
the Halifax Banking Company, was headquartered here in one of his warehouses. It cemented Enos Collins as one of the most successful business tycoons in Canadian history. The Halifax Banking Company would eventually merge with a few other banks to form the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, CIBC. Collins' bank was so successful that rivals chartered their own to compete the government-backed Bank of Nova Scotia, Scotia Bank. When Collins died, the old privateer was the richest person in Canada. By then, privateering had been outlawed, closing the chapter on 300 years of piracy in these waters. Those swashbuckling days were over. The pirates were gone. But they'd left a legacy behind. In time, true stories became embellished and exaggerated. History evolved into myth and legend, becoming folk tales of headless ghosts and buried treasure. A romantic echo of the real pirates who once ruled these waves and who left a lasting mark on these shores. We're here at Christian's Pub in St. John's, Newfoundland, because this is where you'll find a liquid reminder of the pirate age, a drink that's unique to Newfoundland, and whose origins are wrapped up in this province's relationship to that other pirate haven, the Caribbean. It's called Screech, and if you know that name, you know that I'm about to take part in one of the strangest traditions in Canada. Before I head inside and tell you a little more about it, I want to say just very quickly, you can like, comment, and subscribe. You can hit up our Patreon below if you want to help us tell more stories like this one. And you can follow us on social media at This Is Canadiana. Now, I think the time has come for me to become an honorary Newfoundlander. Newfoundland's pirates and privateers brought plenty of riches back from the south, but it also became a tradition to bring back rum. In the early 1800s, literally hundreds of thousands of gallons of Jamaican rum came into port in exchange for thousands of barrels of salted cod. Screech, named for the sound you make when you drink it, became a staple of a Newfoundlander's diet. So if you're ever in town, and want to pay tribute to the seafaring rogues of the past, you can get screeched in here by taking a shot, having a piece of bologna, and kissing the thing that started it all, cod. <laughs> 